We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. You know, as we are going through this series um, called I Will Build My Church, uh, this is something that Jesus said. You know, I've looked forward to this message and, and I want to just start out from the get-go. Before we get into talking about a church that sees, I want to talk about what happens in Matthew chapter 16. But before that, let me show you a picture. I want to share something with you. So this picture here, this is in Caesarea Philippi, okay? And in Caesarea Philippi, a place that is quite a ways away from Jerusalem in Israel and such, um, in Caesarea Philippi, this place is here. It is known as the Gates of Hades. And in antiquity, water would have come out of that cave, The water that came out of that cave is significant because in antiquity, during the time of the Old Testament, during the First Testament, the first half of the Bible, there was a lot of Baal worship that happened there, worship of of a false god. But that worship, it progressed in as far as in going from Baal worship to Pan worship. Both, when I say progress, they were false gods. Pan, it was believed, every winter would go down through the gates of Hades. He would go down into the underworld, the Gentiles believed. And the reason that you knew that is because in winter, what happens? Everything dies. And then it was believed that Pan would come out of the underworld. And how do you know that he's returned? Spring. And so they would do a whole lot of things that are really not good or moral along the way. But what's of significance is that this is a place that the people of God, that good Jews in the first century, they did not go here. In fact, if you had to get from point A to point B and it was in between, they around. They did not go to this area at all. And yet, Jesus looks at his disciples and says, hey, come on, we're going to Caesarea Philippi. So let's go to Caesarea Philippi, okay? He says in Matthew 16, verse 13, it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answered. They said things like, well, some people say that, you know, you're Elijah, that you're one of the prophets. Elsewhere, another, another place, some people were saying, well, you're Jeremiah, come back from the dead. There were all these things that were going on, all these names that were going on. And in the midst of this, Jesus looks them square in the eye. And he says, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? That may be one of the most important questions that you hear all day, that you hear in your entire lifetime. In fact, that is the question. Who is Jesus? Who is he? And it goes on and it says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus goes on and he says, listen, you didn't figure that out. That was, that was revealed to you by my father in heaven. That was revealed to you. And then he goes on in verse 18, and Jesus says, And I tell you that you are Peter. And Peter means a small stone, a pebble. You are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome. This is, this is really significant. He has taken his disciples, he's taken them to a region that nobody goes in the midst of the Gentiles. And not just any place. He's taken them to the place 
And in the midst of that, he asks, who do people say I am? Who do you say I am? And it's upon this rock, the firm foundation, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's the rock on which his kingdom, that's the rock on which his church will be built. That word church, it's ecclesia, as Pastor Matt shared recently. And that word, it's not just something that was made up. It's a word that other people used in antiquity. Ecclesia. And he's saying, listen, the people who gather as my disciples, who gather under my name, the gates of Hades will not overcome because it's based in who he is, not in who we are. It's not about how good we are. It's about how good he is. So as we talk about this, we're going to talk about the purpose of the church. We're going to talk about a church that sees as well. But it's important to understand where we begin. We begin with a Savior who says, listen, I know that there's going to be powers. I know that there's going to be authorities. I know that there's going to be difficulty along the way, but I'm going to be with you and I'm going to send you out. In fact, when we look at the purpose of the church, the first purpose that we see is to reach the lost. Jesus says in Matthew 28, verse 19, therefore go, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now understand when he says go, it's kind of like, you know, you at some point or another, you were growing up or you have kids. Now, parents, as you are going, is there a time when your kids have just, they just hit perfection? It's like, hey, I don't need to instruct my kids anymore. They have figured it out. Is that, is, does that ever happen? Now, as you go, you're like, don't do this, do that. Hey, that's a better idea. Hey, here are two options, blah, blah, blah. And you are downloading into them. It's not all at one time and then that's it. Instead, when Jesus is saying go, it's not just simply, hey, I got a go adventure shirt. So I'm going to go and that's when I'm going to share the good news. No, that's one way. But it's as you go. It might, it's your neighbor it's that person at work. It's that person at the grocery store. Yes, even the creepy one, okay? Especially the creepy one. And let me tell you, at this point in time, if you don't know who the creepy one is, it's probably you. It's okay. It's okay. We're, we're in good company. The second purpose of the church is to build up those we reach, those we reach. Jesus says in verse 21 following, he says, teach these new disciples, these new followers of Jesus, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus hasn't abandoned us. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And it's important to understand, these are some of his last words before he goes to prepare a place for us. He's already died on the cross for our sins. He's overcome death. He's already conquered Satan. He's done all of this. And he has some last words that he doesn't want you to miss. He wants to make it very, very clear how important it is to reach people for Jesus, and as you reach them, to walk with them and teach them what does it look like? What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be, as it were, a disciple? Now, this is affectionately also known as the Great Commission. And I recall when I first came to know Jesus many years ago, I went to this church, East Lansing Trinity. And I remember each Sunday as my pastor would preach, as he would share the message, there were things on the wall. On the first side, it said, great commitment to the great commandment. And on the other side, it said, great commitment to the great commission. The commission, go, oh, make disciples and teach them how to follow me. Not just baptizing them and then, hey, you know, they've, they've faith, repentance, baptism. Yes, but now you need to walk with them. 
just like somebody hopefully walked with you. This is known as the Great Commission. Now, you may or may not have heard those words before, but don't be shocked when I say this, because this is the state of where we are in many places in the church in North America. This question was asked, what is the Great Commission? This is amongst believers, and 51% of the respondents said, I've never heard of it. 25 additional percent of people said, I've heard of it, but they weren't quite certain what it was. They couldn't say what the Great Commission was. Fewer than one in five heard of it and could say what it was. In fact, I'm going to give you the actual stat. 17% of people who claim to be followers of Jesus could say it. I'm not saying whether they know Jesus or don't know Jesus. What I do know is that only 17% are aware of the Great Commission. That we have been sent out, not just to the nations, though that's part of it, but even in your neighborhoods. This, the, and, and for this, one of the things I really, I want you to, to, to be aware, we recognize as a church how important this is. This is why we have growth courses, but we also have something coming this fall. We have a discipleship program that we are putting together here at ACC. It's a 13-week discipleship program, and I can't tell you how many churches that I've been in contact with over the years that they have a way of leading people to Jesus explaining baptism, and then they're like, all right, go be part of a life group. And a life group is a great place. It's a great place to connect with other believers and to grow in Christ. But I can't tell you how many people have shared with me over the years, I've never had somebody disciple me. I've never had somebody just walk with me through the Scriptures. I have so many questions. And so we're making certain that we're not just baptizing record numbers of people and sending them out, but we're sending, we are sending people out into all the world, even into their neighborhoods, with an understanding of what does it mean to follow Jesus, to obey all that He's commanded. The third purpose of the church is to act in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're told in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power, this is Jesus speaking, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, through Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's, as it were, it starts at home and it moves out from there. Yes, go on and go adventure. That's fantastic. Maybe you even, you, you were like, what's that one in the bottom? Well, we're going to Kenya and we're going to Thailand. But start in your backyard. Start at your work. We have been sent. If you count yourself a follower of Jesus and you've wondered if you've been sent, here it is, you're sent. He makes it very clear. But He doesn't send us out alone. He, he says, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's going to enable you to do what you can't do on your own. And if you count yourself a follower of Jesus, if, if you have put your faith in Christ... You've said, listen, I want to follow Jesus, and you've gotten baptized. Guess what? You have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit downloads spiritual gifts into you. Every believer has at least one gift, maybe more, but the Holy Spirit enables you to do what you can't do on your own. In fact, Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am the, brand, or, I am the vine, and you are the branch. If a man remain in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's for all men and women. That's for all disciples of Jesus, all followers of Jesus. We are called to walk with Jesus as we go. The fourth, the fourth purpose of the church is to be a foretaste of the kingdom of God. We're told here in, in John 13, 34, so now... I am giving you a new commandment, Jesus says. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now, I know this is shocking. For some of you along the way, maybe you were thinking, you know, 
They will know we are disciples. We are followers of Jesus. If we go to Chick-fil-A six days a week and get their Chick-fil-A meal, right? Well, we would do it on Sunday, but we're not allowed to. We can't, okay? Maybe it was, you know, if I wear a Go shirt, that's how they're going to know. If I wear my uh, You Belong at ACC shirt, which are pretty awesome as well, that's how they're going to know. If I wear my Jesus jewelry, they'll know that. But that's not what Jesus says, is it? Not even those little testaments. And let me tell you, there's a testament there. Instead, he says, people are going to know you're my followers through your love for one another. And I got to break it to you. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. We only know one who's perfect, and he died on the cross for the world to take away our sins. But the idea of doing life on our own as believers, as followers of Jesus, is a foreign idea. The idea of being a church of one is a foreign idea. And so it's important to understand. We recognize that there are people who are homebound, and maybe you're at home, and you're homebound, and you're not able to be here. Know that we love you. We pray for you. And yet there are some who, they've been, they've been, they go online because that's what's available. But for others, I want to I call you guys back to gather with other believers, especially in life groups. Because Sunday is wonderful. This is the celebration. We celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate Jesus. We, we celebrate what God has done in humanity through Jesus. But being part of a life group, that's where, that's where stuff happens, especially. That's where we eat with one another. We pray with one another. We gather around God's Word with one another. We cry with each other. We celebrate with each other. We do all of these things. We don't go it alone. We carry one another's burdens. And it's not always easy. It's not always easy, but He is always worth it. He is always worth it. And so, you know, if, if you've been on the fence and you've been in this place of, you know, um, I want to be a part of life group, that's fantastic. That is fantastic. For some of you, you had some church hurt along the way. It's okay to get some healing. But still, for some of you, you've been praying and saying, God, do you want me to lead a life group? God, do you, do, do you desire for me to do this? And I'm going to make it really simple. Do you really think that you came up with that idea yourself? I want to say, I want to propose to you that that is the Holy Spirit saying, go, go. And for some of you, you may feel like, I don't feel ready. I don't, I, I, I'm not certain about this. We will come alongside you. We will come alongside you. We will train. And, and it may be one of those things of, hey, going to your life group leader that you're a part of right now. You may go to that life group leader and say, hey, I don't feel ready for this, but I want to learn. Walk with me, please. And they will. They will. But it's, it's so important to understand that you cannot reach what you cannot see. When we talk about all the purposes of the church, we can talk about those, but at the end of the day, you cannot reach what you cannot see. And so if we're going to be a church that sees, we've got to talk about what that looks like. I want to talk about that in a moment, but I want to share a story that we find in John chapter 4. We're going to run through this very quickly. But in John chapter 4, there's this story of the woman at the well. And there's this place called Samaria. And this is a place that much like, much like Caesarea Philippi, people didn't go here. And when I say people, I mean God honoring Israelites, Hebrews, Jews. They did not go here. And Jesus, and in fact, it would be that if this is where you are, here's where you're going, same thing. If it's in the middle, you go way around, out of your way. And Jesus says, you know that place that none of us go? We're going there. 
we're going there. And he goes. And when he's there, he meets a woman at the well. The disciples, they've gone into town. And as he meets this woman in the middle of the day, at a time when nobody else would come to the well, because she had a little bit of a reputation. Everybody in town probably knew her and knew her reputation. Jesus comes there. Now, does he download truth into her immediately and go, you know what? Um, you need to, you, let me share the, the truth of the matter. You're headed to hell right now. You're, you're, you're committing adultery. It's totally wrong. No, he didn't start there. When we read the Gospels, we find that Jesus always begins with grace before he moves into truth. He starts with a relationship, a conversation oftentimes. He doesn't start out as some have over the years of saying, you're going to hell. Now, is there a place for that conversation at some point or another? Sure, there's a, a time for that, yes. But why don't we start someplace else first? Let's start with, hi, I'm a human being, you're a human being, I'm broken, you're broken, and guess what? The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Let's start there. I have clay feet just like you. And the only time that you don't see my clay feet is when I'm on my knees, and it's the same for you. You'll fail me and I'll fail you, but you know what? There's one who will never fail. And he died on the cross. And he's gone to prepare a place for all those who call upon his name. And he wants everybody there. He wants everybody there. But in the midst of this conversation with the woman at the well, his disciples come back. And it says in John 4, 27 and following, it says, just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village. At the same time that she's running back to the village to say, I met a man who told me everything about me. I think he might be the Messiah. I think he might be the Messiah. And they came. And he ended up actually staying in the city and, and sharing the good news of the kingdom of God for some time. But the disciples are sitting there asking questions. In fact, they're asking the wrong questions. She's a person of peace. She's the person that hears the gospel and goes, I want to share this with others. I got, I, this information, I got to get this out there. When you have hit rock bottom and you look up and you see the Son of God, you want to tell everybody because He takes you out of that pit. He takes you out of the bottom of the barrel. He gives you a purpose. He gives you a plan. And I remember in my own life, early on in my walk, early on in my own walk, I didn't know Jesus. I was far from Him. I was out getting high, doing drugs, and, and practicing witchcraft. That's where my life was. And I had a friend who would actually come alongside me, the only Christian I knew of, and I would ask her my questions about the Bible. But you know what's telling? It wasn't until after I came to know Jesus that I found out that I had a lot of friends who were followers of Jesus. How sad. So many friends around me, yet nobody, nobody valued me enough to share with me the good news in any way, shape, form. No grace, no truth. In essence, saying, John, you can go to hell and I won't say a word. Penn and Teller, uh, I think it's Penn, he, he does not believe in the Lord, but he respects people who try to share the good news with him. He says things along the lines of, how, how can a person hate someone so much that they would say, allow for them to go to hell? Man, 
man, the Great Commission, seriously, it matters. It truly does. But again, we have to begin with grace before turning to truth. And Jesus continues on in John 4, 36. He says, the harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. People brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvest. And it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work and now you will get to gather the harvest. I have a couple friends here this morning who at the end of the service, they're going to actually be moving to Texas, the country of Texas, I'm told by some. (laughs) They're going to go to a place that they've not been. And other people have been working, other people have been sharing the good news with those neighbors in their workplace, wherever it is. And they're going to show up and they're going to share the good news. And both are going to reap a reward. They have also shared the good news. They've walked with people here for the last few years. And it may be you. You may lead someone to Jesus because of their work. You may come to know Jesus because of your relationship with them. God is always working upstream, so we don't have to fear because God is always at work before we even get there, before we ever get there, wherever it is. So I want you to hear clearly these three characteristics of a church that sees because we want to be a church that honors God. We want to be a church that sees with God's eyes. And the first characteristic of a church that sees is we see our purpose. We see our purpose. We read in Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple. Jesus said to him, so Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. People didn't think much of the IRS in that time. And if you're an IRS agent, you didn't hear that from me. (laughs) But it goes on and it says, but when the Pharisees saw this, remember tax collectors, sinners, Jesus calls the person that nobody likes to be his disciple. They didn't just say sinners, they're like tax collectors and sinners. Inferring tax collectors are worse in that day. I'm not kidding. (laughs) But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor Sick people do. Sick people do. At the earlier service, there was someone here who uh, uh, just recently, I believe last week, was overseas. And they, they work in medicine. They're a medical professional. And as they went overseas, there was going to be a medical clinic in the morning. And she rose up early. She wanted to see a beautiful sunrise. And let me tell you, she saw the most beautiful sunrise any one person can ever see. She saw a sea of people outside. Some had traveled for hours. Others had traveled for days to get here for medical help. That is a sunrise of the kingdom of God. When we can see with our eyes what God is wanting to do. It's been said, people theologize differently on an empty stomach. I would say that people theologize differently when they recognize their brokenness. I know I did. But I also know that as we are called to minister to the broken, as we are called to minister... 
It's kind of like a hospital. It's kind of like a hospital, and hospitals can be difficult. Hospitals, sometimes, I know when I first started in ministry, I worked in a hospital for a time, and there were smells. There was pain. There was hardship. There was difficulty along the way. It's important that we see that we have been sent, that we have a purpose, that we've been given the great commission. And the second characteristic of a church that sees is we see His perspective. We see His perspective. Even when I was in the hospital, when I was working in the hospital, it was difficult. But when I got his perspective, it began to change everything. It began to change everything. And, and Matthew, Jesus says, he talks in Matthew 9, 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What's your attitude when you see the lost? Do you have compassion not just the automatic, the, the, you know, the knee-jerk reaction, but do you really have com- compassion? Do you really have empathy? I recall many years ago, I went to a Christian conference. It was known as the North American Christian Convention. It's now known as uh, Spire Conference. And when I went, it was in Indianapolis. And while I was there, I was talking with some homeless people. And as I was talking with them, they, they look out for each other a lot oftentimes. And as I talked with them, I said, hey, I'm curious. Is there any difference when the Christian convention comes to town? And they immediately said, oh, yeah, there is a huge difference when there's a Christian convention. With... Now, remember, this is all leaders of the church coming and gathering. And, and I went, really? Really? What's the difference? Oh, it's really clear. They bring their families a little bit closer and they walk a whole lot faster. That's sad. In fact, that should break every one of our hearts. Believer, non-believer, guess what? It breaks our heart to see anyone do that. And let's be honest, we've all done that at some point or another because we've at some point or another, we've seen the person on the side of the road, we've seen a friend, we've seen a loved one, and we see the problem and we do that look, you know, you know the one, either the, the thousand mile stare, I'm not going to look over there, or looking off to the side as if not to see. And in essence, we're saying that person doesn't matter. They matter to God, but they don't matter to me. Not enough. And in the midst of this, I remember asking those homeless people about this. And the next words were very telling. He said, but you know, you know who, you know who, who, when they come to town, you know who just loves us and walks with us and do, it just goes above and beyond? Those NASCAR people. That's right. Now, I like to think that there's a lot of believers amongst the NASCAR enthusiasts. But maybe there's some things that the church needs to learn sometimes from the world. What a sad commentary. When we could have just learned it from Jesus in His words. The third characteristic of the church that sees is we see His passion. We're told in Luke 15, verse 3, So Jesus told them this story, If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them, just one of them, gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me! Because I have found my lost sheep. 
In the same way, he says, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner. That's right, joy. Over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Imagine coming to a hospital. Now we're going to go to the hospital and there's 99 of us in that hospital. We're all healthy. Everything's going great. But there is this one person over here. They have cancer. In fact, they, they've learned that they have stage four cancer. They've been told it's hopeless. Say your goodbyes, get your affairs in order. The only thing that could possibly save you is an act of God. Amen. Do you think there's going to be more rejoicing over their, those 99 healthy people or that one person whose journey into death with no hope. I think that we would rejoice over that one person. And, and the scriptures are clear. Listen, there are 99 people who you've got it together. You're healthy. You know Jesus. But there's this one person over here and they don't know that God has any kind of purpose, any kind of plan for their life. In fact, up until this point, if they shared the story of their life with you, you yourself would break. And they live it every single day. They walk through it every single moment of every single day. Whether at your work, whether in your neighborhood, whether at the grocery store, wherever it is. And God says, when that one person comes, there is rejoicing in heaven. There is a party. Not, hey, you got to get together. You're not doing the right thing. Blah, 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 blah. No, no. But that's where discipleship comes in. That's where walking with people, the people of God have to walk with people. And guess what, people? As people of God, as followers of Jesus, we're going to screw up. I'm going to screw up. There's going to be times that I'm going to have faith for you and you're going to have faith for me. And sometimes I'm going to have to forgive you and you're going to have to forgive me. And that is a choice. That is an orientation of the heart. So this week as we come to what now, God? There's a lot that's been downloaded today. And I don't know what the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart. You may or may not even be following the Lord. And so if you don't know the Lord, maybe the Lord has said, hey, it's time to stop trying to do it on your own. It's time to put faith in me. It's time to begin walking with Jesus. For some of you, you've been walking with Jesus or you have just started and guess what? It's time to get baptized. It's time to take that step of obedience that we're told in scriptures, in the scriptures that even Jesus did in order to fulfill all righteousness. But Jesus, do you really need that? Listen, I'm trying to show you what I want you to do. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe it's discipleship. Some, you need somebody to come alongside you and that is coming this fall. And if that is you, we want to come alongside you. Maybe it's joining a life group or maybe, maybe it's leading a life group. And all of these things that are wandering around in your heart and in your mind, it's so easy to say, it's just me. That's just my thoughts. That's just my heart. And I'm here to say, no, that's the Holy Spirit working. So don't let the day go by. Maybe it's a go adventure. Maybe that go adventure is to the fence. It's time to step out of your comfort zones because Jesus said upon this rock upon the foundation of Jesus upon the fact that he is the Christ he is the Messiah the son of the living God upon that rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will 
not prevail. No matter how hard it looks in the world, no matter how broken the world may look, God is not done yet. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we ask that you would move us out of our comfort zones, that you would move us to greater grace for one another, that you would move us in such a way that we would value others the way that you value them, that you would help us to see what you see and that we would be as passionate for this world as you are. Your love knows no bounds. You held nothing back. You wanted eternity with every single one of us and you made certain that that was a possibility when you sent your son. We pray that you would strengthen us, that you would embolden us, and that as you have sent us out, that you would help us to hear clearly from heaven and that we would unashamedly say your name and share the gospel with others. We pray, ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.